Hey, what's up, everybody? Got a special edition of Tom Parents Patriot Stock Podcast for this week. The reason? Well, Tom Brady's back in town. And we thought it'd be fun as he comes back for what will be his final game at Gillette Stadium to trace back to where he lived when he first moved here. And as always, thanks to my buddy, John Henry, who makes sure all these pods get edited and out on time. Enjoy. Over 22 years, as Tom Brady's NFL fortunes have changed, so have his homes. Right now, he lives in Tampa on ultra-exclusive Davis Island. Before that, he was up in Chestnut Hill. Before that, sprawling estate out in California, Brentwood. That was purchased by Dr. Dre for like $40 million. There was a New York City penthouse. Lived in Calm Abbey. Lived in Marina Bay. But as Tom Brady returns for what will be his final game in New England, let's go all the way back to the place he first hung his hat. Nine Crestwood, Franklin, Mass., the Chestnut Ridge Condominium Complex. Just about 10 minutes from what was then Foxborough Stadium. Dave Nugent, a defensive end taken by the Patriots with the 201st pick in the 2000 draft, recalls how he and Brady came to live together at Nine Crestwood back in 2000. So the day we found out that we both made the team, we were staying at the End Zone Motel, and he knocked on my door, came in, sat down on the bed, said, hey, I heard you made the team, congratulations. I just made the team too. And he said, I just bought a, a condo from Ty Law and uh, wanted to know if you'd be interested in being my roommate. And I remember at the time thinking that's, you know, pretty confident that he had already negotiated this condo deal, you know, as a four string quarterback, but I'm like, I didn't have a place to stay. So I thought that was a pretty sweet deal for me. So that's how it all began. Well, it was, it was a really sweet setup. Uh, we were probably the youngest neighbors on our cove by probably about 50 years. Um, so it was very quiet cove, very peaceful, but you know, Ty left everything in the condo. He left the big screen TV that was built into the wall downstairs in the basement, the big leather wraparound couch, uh, left all his bedroom furnishings. So we thought we were living the high life when we moved into that place. It was a lot of fun. Brady's other roommate in 2000 was tight end Chris Eitzman, an undrafted player from Harvard who grew up playing eight man football out in Nebraska. Yeah, when he was thinking of buying it, he said, you know, if, if, I, if I get this from Ty, would you be interested in living with me? And I'm like, yeah, of course. If I make the team, I'm, because at the time I was living in the basement of one of my roommates from Harvard, um, his parents' house in Canton. So, <laughs> and, and, and not, it, they were fantastic people to me, but look, at some point, you, you got to get out of your friend's parents' basement. And so Tom understood that situation, obviously, and said, yeah, come, let's let's get this thing and um, we'll go from there. I, I mean, we, we hit it off pretty well right off the bat um, from a, a friendship standpoint. And on the field, I think that's where it really developed. We both had similar work ethics. I always wanted to stay after and just run some extra routes, work on what I need, felt I needed to work on. He always did too. It worked out pretty naturally that he was a quarterback and I was a tight end. Mm -hmm. So we would just stay after practice or we'd go out in the afternoons after lifting when we were, you know, before training camp started. Um, I'd run routes, he'd throw, and we'd basically go until I couldn't go anymore. He'd always want to keep going longer, but I'm like, look, at some point my legs are dying. I can't, can't do this. These were three guys in their early 20s who had an opportunity in 2000 with a team that was being completely renovated. They took that chance seriously, says Eitzman. It was a lot of fun, to be honest with you. I mean, we, Tom's a big thinker, um, obviously, and my background, I am too, I would say. Um, so we'd have those moments where, you know, we'd have a lot of deep conversations, but there was a ton of laughs too. There's pr practical jokes all the time. Um, but it was, look, it was all about football. That's what our focus was. We, um, that's what we were living and breathing and doing every day. So discussions about football, what careers could look like, should look like, you know, upcoming games, practices, all that kind of stuff. Um, 
but knowing Tommy as people do now, there's another side to him that's this big intellectual thing that kind of challenges the status quo on a frequent basis. And he doesn't just do that with football. He does it with everything about life, hence TB12 and, you know, his whole movement to kind of change the way people think about what is the optimal way to train your body for not only peak performance, but longevity. And those were ideas that he had started formulating, you know, way back then even. Yeah, he was, uh, he was very reserved. Um, he came in uh, very quiet, very low key, um, but took everything that he did seriously, all the practices, the workouts. Um, he was always a professional right from the get go. I remember that about him. Tom Brady Sr. remembers his son's first roommates. They just, uh, they were great guys, both guys. Um, I, I haven't seen in a long, long, long time or neither guy have I seen, but uh, they were both wonderful guys uh, and they had a great competition together. They used to to spend a lot of time together and, and uh, you know, they were just trying to figure out the ropes. I mean, they were just two perfect, perfect roommates. I mean, bo both guys were absolute quality guys and they just had a lot of fun together. And I know, I mean, Tommy was working really hard. I think there were all three of them just trying to find their way. And um, it was a perfect situation for young guys coming into the league to be able to surround yourself with really good people who are really hardworking and dedicated. And at the same time, play, had a lot of fun playing uh, goofy, goofy games. No goofy game was taken as seriously as Tech Mobile. Well, I remember it was very, we had a very calm environment at the house. Like I said, he was very low key reserved. So I enjoyed that aspect, but we would in the off season come home from workouts and we would literally play tech mobile all day long. We grill out. And that's the first time that I saw the intense competitor in Tom because he hated to lose. And we had these tournaments that would last all weekend long where it was, you know, if you won, you were the house champ. And I mean, if he didn't win, we had literally dents in our wall from him throwing the controller against the wall. Uh, or if he knew he was going to get stomped so bad, he'd stomp on the floor because it would short out the system and start the game over. <laughs> uh, so that's when I first saw that there was, there was some intensity uh, inside of that guy. All right. So was it just you and him for 48 hours at a time? Or was Chris involved or did any other teammates come in? No, it was just three of us. I mean, like I said, we'd, we'd go to workouts in the morning and we couldn't wait to get back to the condo because we, we had our tournament all set up and ready and we'd play the entire weekend. That's all we did. Here's Chris Eitzman. Well, he would always try to cheat. You know, he'd be, he'd be the 49ers or the Raiders and always get the best teams. Um, I forget how we actually chose. I think it was like a rolling thing where you get a, everybody gets a draft of the team uh, on a certain week and then the next week it, you'd, your rotation in the draft would change <laughs> um but yeah they were they were epic we we had a lot of fun in those tournaments now dave alleges that it wasn't just <clears throat> a matter of him him getting pissed during the the games there would be obvious kicking of the plug hitting of the reset I mean, that, that type of thing was going on on a regular basis, apparently. Oh, yeah, absolutely. If he, if he was losing, there was there, he was going to try to find a way to make sure the game didn't end. In 2000, Eitzman was released before the end of training camp. He returned to the team and finished the season with the Patriots. He remembers that in those days, Brady could live life completely undetected. That first year, he was such a... Nobody really knew who he was, right? right? When you looked at him, he didn't look like a football player at, at all. So we would, we, you know, we'd go out like that the rookie year. If Tom and I went to a grocery store or we went to a restaurant or something, there were more people that came up and asked me for my autograph than they did his. And <laughs> next year, that obviously changed a lot. <laughs> but it was, you know, I, I think it used to eat at him a little bit. We just didn't, you know, normal things. I mean, that's the great thing about him. And it was probably good for me at that time is he wasn't wild and crazy and didn't go out all the time. You know, we went to dinner and movies and, um, you know, it's funny, like he's this fashion icon now, but we used to go to men's warehouse and load up on, you know, jackets at men's warehouse and 
uh, no, it was just very low key and just a really enjoyable time together. He's done amazing things with his body, obviously, to be able to play this long, but it's he's changed it so much too. He was, he was skinny, he was slow. He had this nasty red beard at the beginning when he first showed up at uh, mini camps, and yeah, he didn't he didn't look the part. But the one thing that you know was so amazing is that even though people were so dismissive of him, his confidence was just through the roof about what he could do and his ability. In 2001, Eitzman was gone. He'd signed with the Browns after the Patriots released him. He didn't get to see his roommate, Brady, emerge from his chrysalis. Nugent did. And the reactions Brady began to get as the 2001 season wore on, they were eye-opening. I remember we also, so every Thursday night, we go to dinner to movie because we had an easy practice on Friday. And I remember the first time he really, really got noticed was um, we were at an Outback Steakhouse and we paid the bill and stood up to walk out. The entire restaurant stood up and gave him a standing ovation as we're walking out. And that was late in the season or early playoffs. And I remember we got back in the car and I remember he just sat there, he said, can you believe that just happened? He was just so overwhelmed, he could not believe that that just happened. And he was becoming a star right before my eyes. The neighbors around Nine Crestwood, they began to take notice too. You know, it's so funny. So we had this um, older couple um, that lived right next to us. And like I said, we didn't, we didn't party or anything crazy. But I remember one night he had his computer speakers playing pretty loud. And it lined up to the wall, you know, facing their condo. And all of a sudden we get a knock on the door and there was police there. And they come in expecting this huge party. And they're like, where's the party? And we're like, there's no party. It's just us two. And they're like, oh, your neighbors called, said there was a big party over here. And, and that was our rookie year. Well, it's funny because fast forward, you know, 12 months later, and all of a sudden he's the star of Boston. And they're coming over all the time asking for autographs for their, you know, grandchildren. And it's just funny how things changed. Even though they lived together on and off for just a year, Eitzman says he still looks back on that relationship that he forged with Brady is having left an indelible impression. You ever met anybody like that? You ever met anybody like him? Not with that intensity. And and just that like powerful of and and truly believing it, right? You, you know, you you meet in professional sports and in life, you meet a lot of arrogant people who have belief in their abilities and think they're, you know, probably better than they are. But deep down, you can tell that it's more for show than it is their true belief. And with Tommy, it was it was in his core. He knew he was going to be great, and Did he you? knew he was going to be he knew he was going to be the starter much earlier than anybody anticipated. To your earlier question about if I ever met anybody like it, no, it, you know, absolutely not. But do I take pieces of my time with Tommy and the continued relationship we've had with me every day? Absolutely. He, there's so many amazing qualities that he has, but he has this ability to connect with people on a level that few people do, right? So when you're having a conversation with him, you feel like you're the only person that really matters to him. And, he, and, and that is something that I think makes him so good because everybody on the team feels that same way about him. And he just gets everybody to rally around him all the time and that's that's a lesson that I've tried to take with me in my life and just in, in interpersonal relationships and in the workplace and you know in, in every facet because it, it it is a really powerful thing I can't do it remotely as well as he can but um just having that connection and making when you're having a conversation with someone making them feel like you're the only thing in the world that matters. It's a really powerful tool if you can get good at it. The amazing thing is, is that, you know, so much has changed in his life over the last 22 years. And yet anytime I ask him for anything, anytime I send him an email, there's always a response back. Phone calls, emails, you know, there's some charity thing that I'm trying to support, you know, instantaneously. He's like, yeah, 
Absolutely. Just tell me what you need, where to send it. Brady moved out of that condo in 2003, moved up to Marina Bay, another Thai law transaction that got Brady a little closer to the city. The man who bought that condo from him though, Franklin Legal, he's still there. I don't know if this is necessarily like saying George Washington slept here, but... <laughs> it's close. It is close. <laughs> Do you get many pastors by through the years? Not very many. I think at that particular time when Tom was here, uh, he had neighbors. Most of, most of the neighbors here, I think, were around then. Uh, but really, there wasn't that... At least he wasn't as uh, famous as he is now. Correct. Well, he was just going through the motions, getting there. Well, how do you feel about what's going to happen in a week or so when he comes back? Oh, it's going to be pandemonium. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you going to root for? You're, you're the former owner of your place or the Patriots? You know, I'll, I'll root for Tom. I, I just want to see him do big things, bigger things, if you look at it this way. There's a lot of people in the same boat as you, Franklin. Thank you for taking the time. Oh, you're most welcome. So that's the story of Nine Crestwood might not be as compelling as the story Brady forged just a few miles down the road at Gillette Stadium, but still worth telling.